Hi, welcome to my channel, Inner Goddess Guidance. My name is Laura, and this channel is about assisting people who are on a self-healing path toward self-mastery. And now I'm going to add in the service of divine love, because that's what we're doing. We're in the service of divine love. And um, I got another prompting from Spirit that I needed to sit down and make this video, even though it's after midnight and I was totally in bed, asleep, <laughs> woke up, did some interacting online with the Facebook group. And by the way, what a bunch of beautiful people are in that group. I say people because there is one man, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing group of people and support. Anyway, so after I did that, um, I was actually just saying, wow, you know, I really haven't been getting any information. And then uh, lo and behold, about three minutes later, four minutes later, it all came flooding in. So what I want to share with you is some information. I was prompted to look up some information about Rumi. I mean, I had gotten the information and then that prompted me to go look up information to sort of verify what I was getting. And, um, and here it is, essentially, in a nutshell. And I hope I can make it through because I really don't want to shoot this video twice. <laughs> I really want to go back to bed. Um, so Rumi is probably the most popular, famous um, poet probably in the world. Um, he is the most popular poet in the United States and many other countries. And I think one of the reasons why we love his poetry is it speaks so beautifully about divine love. Now, a lot of people interpret his poetry to mean partner love. But in actuality, he was... Um, he was speaking of divine love or, or he was calling the divine beloved in m many of his poems. And I'm not an expert. I literally went in, looked at Wikipedia, picked up a few things to verify what I was given. Um, but I did know that as a Sufi mystic, his path was in service of of connecting with the divine and um, and he did that through through poetry and through many other things so one of the things that that I read when I was reading the Wikipedia article is this Rumi encouraged Sama listening to music and turning or doing the sacred dance. In the Mev Mevlevi tradition, Sama represents a mystical journey. Here's where you want to pay attention. A mystical journey of spiritual ascent through mind and love to the perfect one. The perfect one being the divine. In this journey, the seeker symbolically turns toward the truth, grows through love, abandons the ego, finds the truth, and arrives at the perfect. The seeker then returns from this spiritual journey with greater maturity to love and to be of service to the whole of creation without discrimination with regard to beliefs, races, classes, and nations. So this um, practice of Sama evidently turned into the whirling dervishes, which you can look up if you've never seen that beautiful dance that's done. It's a, a mystical dance um, or to create a mystical experience. Of course, many traditions have um, practices like that, um, using dance and using music and using chanting, for example. 
But what was what what popped out to me um, and what I was being guided from originally that made me look that up was that Rumi was recognizing that it's d the divine and union or reunion with the divine that is the greatest sense of love that we can experience. So in that sense, the divine is the beloved. And I was struck by recognizing that twin flames recognize we're awakened in a sense to this whole journey or to being a divine counterpart to being a twin right we're, we're awakened to being a twin i've always thought when we recognize the divine in another and it sparks us in such a way of pure love that's not irrational it doesn't make sense. You can't say, why do I suddenly love this person who in many cases may be from, you know, you may not speak the same languages. There's people who are twins who are in different countries or um, in, from vastly different traditions or social groups or ages or, you know, there's like everything on the outside um, often challenges the status quo, what we've been raised with and our definitions. But for some reason, it doesn't matter. We still have this, this spark that was lit in us. In other words, I think we recognize the flame in them. We recognize or have reignited then that flame in us. It becomes a doorway then to the same kind of journey that he's is being described here with Rumi. A journey toward reunion with the divine, but it's reunion within and without because it's connecting to everybody else. And our twin awakens that journey and prompts us because romantic love is um it's intoxicating it's beautiful and there are many components of that relationship that are so compelling even though they don't make sense and so what i realized is that one of the things that I have tried to hold myself accountable, fiercely accountable for, um, is that ever since I woke up to what the journey was, this t twin flame journey, I wanted to be of service to that love, not to my this person, not to the other, but to that divine love path. And then my way of perceiving the relation, uh, a, any relationship, but especially and particularly a romantic relationship changed. And my behavior changed. And it wasn't because somebody told me it was right or wrong to do it. It's because I really wanted to do it. I wanted to be of service to that. You know, there's a lot of reasons that people get in relationships and a lot of us have been in relationships that we can say their karmic nature or, you know, for whatever reason, like I truly believe that I married my husband who I loved. We had a mission together my husband and I, and it was to create our son. And we did that well. I mean, he's amazing and he's a gift.
But our, our relationship became dysfunctional in part because it didn't have that divine spark to awaken us each to work toward holding ourselves accountable to having the, the behaviors that were going to be in service of healthy love. But now I'm that that's awakened in me. I feel like I'm in service of divine love every day and working toward that, whether that's with my twin or not. And so what's awakened in me is the same kind of understanding I think that Rumi was speaking about in speaking about the beloved, that there is this infinite divine love that is um, overwhelming. It's home. It's our essence. And we don't really have to wait until death to return to it. It's sort of interesting because I think that a lot of religious traditions in terms of spiritual practice are headed that direction. And yet you can have very dysfunctional partnerships within these religious institutions, for example. And, and so what can really motivate people is a divine partnership because it is so nurturing and beautiful and special and um, passionate. So I wanted to share with you Rumi's poem on awakening because I think that you'll see in this poem how what he's talking about um, when he talks about the divine um, he's, he's referencing it through a romantic love, a physical partnership. Yeah, I'll talk more about that in a minute. So it's called The Awakening. In the early dawn of happiness, you gave me three kisses so that I would wake up to this moment of love. I tried to remember in my heart what I'd dreamt about during the night before I became aware of this moving of life. I found my dreams, but the moon took me away. It lifted me up to the firmament and suspended me there. I saw how my heart had fallen on your path, singing a song between my love and my heart. Things were happening, which slowly, slowly made me recall everything. You amuse me with your touch, although I can't see your hands. You have kissed me with tenderness, although I haven't seen your lips. You are hidden from me, but it is you that keeps me alive. Perhaps the time will come when you will tire of kisses. I shall be happy, even for insults from you. I only ask that you keep some attention for me. So, you know, talking about kisses and touch and it all sounds very physical. And he was definitely evoking that. He was talking to the divine. He was talking about the divine. Um, so Rumi, through his practices and through his poetry, he was talking about divine love and divine union very much the same way twin flames do. Um, and... And it occurred to me then why I changed the word 
A lot of people use divine counterpart, twin, um, divine masculine, divine feminine to describe their twin. And, and I had decided that beloved was the word that I wanted to use. And now I know why. Because that is what I am loving in my twin. I am loving the beloved. And I'm in service of that. Now, once we get there, then I think there's a shift to understanding that we are, our goal here is to create then divine love in the 3D here. We are agents of that divine love. And so, you know, here are our institutions. I was thinking about churches, you know, people go in and get married and they have all the good intentions, but often what drives the marriages, and if you think about maybe the first relationships you had or your marriages, they're contracts. They're, they're social contracts. They're not about divine love. They're about something that works. You know, I mean, at one point it was about um, property, you know, marrying in the same social level to have property or, you know, you go back and, and study the, the history of marriage. And it's kind of fascinating because it, it's only until it's only until very recently that we started looking at it as a way to sort of self-actualize and to love another. And even today, I think a lot of people, <clears throat> well, I think even, even I can be honest and say that but when I got married, I was 30. I was feeling the need to have a child. And I found a wonderful man who was wonderful in many, many ways. But I never had that spark of divine love. That's not what I saw in him. There wasn't an unconditionality to it that there is when I met my twin. The unconditionality that says, okay, it doesn't matter. And I will always hold this space. And then when I started learning, I know that it's because we've been doing this for lifetimes and lifetimes and all of that stuff. Um, so your challenge then is to shift all of your behavior in your everyday life and make it in service of divine love, not just for your twin but in every relationship and in everything you do, but absolutely and certainly in relationship to your twin. I often think, you know, we, we have the desire, but we don't have the capacity, the tools to have healthy relationship or healthy love. And so what this experience does is it ignites in us the desire to now do the work to gain the tools so that we can have that healthy love. But the healthy love isn't ever supposed to be reserved for that person. It's to be shared. And depending on who you talk to, you know, I mean, I haven't been on this journey for too long, but depending on who you talk to, what union looks like can be different. You know, we're supposed to sort of blow the, we're supposed to challenge the norms of relationship. So I do think we, 
we come into union and what i would say is that that's coming into a balance into a healthy loving relationship but the but the definition of that what that looks like i think can vary at least that's where i'm at right now because i think that healthy friendship can be in service of love i think that um it doesn't have to be based upon whatever definitions I've carried with me in my life. And I don't think it's like um, happily ever after in, in, in Disney films. <laughs> Even though as a little girl, I totally wanted that. Are you kidding? <laughs> anyway, so the last thing I, I want to leave this with is the last thought. Um, it, our words from Rumi that again was in the Wikipedia article because I think there was a he did blur I think that he may have recognized that a relationship a love relationship was a pathway to the divine if I didn't already say that I probably did it's late and, and it's these words right here. He, he wrote, the lover's cause, the lover's cause is separate from all other causes. The lover's cause is separate from all other causes. Love is the astrolabe of God's mysteries. Love is the astrolabe of God's mysteries. So an astrolabe, for those of you who may not know that word, is just it's it was a um, it was for navigating on ships. It was a tool that was used to help guide ships. So we could um, maybe put in compass would be another word you could use there. So love is the compass. Love is the the tool by which we navigate. God's mysteries. The lover's cause is separate from all other causes. Love is the astrolabe of God's mysteries. When I had my son, everything shifted in my life. I knew what unconditional love was on a way that I've never understood it before. I never, I never, I never felt it that way. I mean, I have unconditional love for lots of people in my life, but not the way I have it for my son. But we have that for our twins when we recognize that piece of divinity in them and it makes absolutely no sense. Why would you have that for somebody suddenly? Because it's divine, it's a gift and it's a pathway. It's a huge gift. And for me, whether I ever have, well, any kind of union, reunion, it's still been a gift. And the journey is a gift. So that's what I wanted to say. Actually, that's what the divine wanted me to say. And now that I am done, I feel pretty good. And maybe I can go to sleep and have a great dream. So that was the special message for, I guess, you know, maybe it's for the eclipse. Just be thinking about every behavior, everything you do now. Not that it's in service of reunion, not that that 
because if you take that away, it should still be important. It should still be your mission. It should still be worthy. And recognize that it's a doorway to div union with the divine in us and in everyone else. And we are agents of that. And that is a pretty awesome thing. So, hope you have a good night. I lost my screen. Let's see if I can get it back up. Okay. Have a good night.